Good morning. Hope everybody's doing all right this morning. Um, we are here at the bunker again here in Knox, Vegas, and um, I'm with the normal crew with uh, Jarrett and Chris this morning. So um, we're glad to be here. We're going to do another presentation off of our meter school series this morning. It's one that we present at the meter school, which is um, the Billing versus Metering Axie presentation. Once again, you see my name on there, but I didn't come up with this. This was a uh, another. This is a, a Steve Hudson presentation. So uh, I got to give credit where credit's due. Um, so uh, we're glad to be here this morning. We're going to go through this. It's got some good info in it. And um, you know I am, before we get rocking, I'm going to go ahead and say a quick prayer and then we'll get started. Lord, thank you so much for this time today. And Father, in the midst of everything that goes on, um, sometimes it doesn't seem that way. But according to your word, and we know deep in our hearts that it's true, that you will never leave us and never forsake us. In the midst of all the turmoil and chaos, you are the one true God. And uh, we turn to you. We, uh, we ask that you step in where you can. Uh, I know that you're going to get, you give us free will, but Father, right now it's just uh, it's tough to watch the news, tough to see what's going on sometimes. But in the end, we always know you are in control of everything. Thank you so much, Father, for your son and what he did so that I can pray right now. And all of these things I say and ask according to the will of the one who paid it all, our brother, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so today we're going to talk billing versus metering accuracy. And they've gotten brave and given me the clicker so that I can click through this stuff. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is um, we said me meter versus billing accuracy. So um, and we'll get into more exactly what that is, but let's just start out with the basic why metering accuracy. And as you can see on the screen, it says, uh, to ensure that a meter is meeting the accuracy requirements mandated by the PSC and management. And we test it in the lab under conditions mandated by uh, C1220 and the metering manufacturer. So generally for a class uh, 20 uh, CT uh, metered site, this means the, for so you test full load, light load, power factor. And we know that, um, that mo it's going to say it right on the face of that meter, right? It's going to say TA equals 2.5. And it says TA equals 2.5 according to ANSI. It means then that uh, that will be your full load. If it says that it's 30, then that'll be your full load. If it says TA is 30. I mean, we know, jumping over to the light load, that that is always one-tenth. So if it says on the face of that meter, TA equals 2.5, then we know our light load is going to be 0.25. If it says the TA is 30 amps, then we know our light load is going to be 3. So it's always one-tenth. And then, of course, you have power factor, which will always make the power factor 0.5, which would be a 60-degree vector shift that you would see on the vectors. And so the cosine of the 60 would equate to a 0.5 a power factor, which would be really bad. So it gives you a really bad power factor. We test it with a, a decent load on it, and we test it with a very light load on it. And that is considered the phantom load test, or the ANSI test, you'll hear it called as well. So these points do not match the optimum operating points in the real world. The CT is optimum actually only above 5 amps. So remember, these are 300 to 5, 400 to 5, 600 to 5, that 5 on the secondary side. So ANSI testing covers limited conditions, uh, sinusoidal waveforms, 0.25 amps and 2.5 amps. So uh, the comparison you're talking about here is that you have the ANSI test versus we're going to talk about here in a minute, which is the customer load test. Okay, so this is the ANSI test right now on the meter. So it is, you're given two test points, full load, light load, and then you're given the third part of the test is the uh, power factor. But you're given two points to test, okay? So um, and it says here electronic meters generally either work correctly or fail drastically. Um, we've gone uh, from the uh, electromechanicals now, which you know you need to be almost a jeweler, and it was an art form to adjust them, and they could get out just a little bit. But the electronic meters now generally they work or don't work. And uh, it says it should be a rare occasion that a meter fails to meet these accuracy standards in the lab, and that is. Uh, as we're going to see here in a second, there's a big difference between lab and field, right? For any of you out there testing. So if the meter is functioning accurately, what does that say about whether or not the customer is getting the correct bill? Well, not that much really. There's so much more to the puzzle now of why you're losing money. It's way more than the meter. We tended back in the old days, that was the first uh, point of focus, right? You go to the meter first. But now over the years we've learned with the improvement of the meters and they're so much better, functionally and accurately that now we're looking at other parts of the system a lot more is where your 
major problems are, or to you and me what that equates to is most revenue loss, okay? So let's look at a typical uh, metering installation right here. So the meter measures only the voltage and current reaching the meter terminals. So what's happening besides that, it doesn't know or care, it just knows what's going on right there where it's connected, right? So it says the wiring errors result in in incorrect metering. Uh, degraded wiring overburden CTs or allows burden to bypass the meter. Remember, burden's just resistance. So if we uh, create resistance through either too small wire, bad connections, that resistance when we're talking about CTs is burden. So I'm creating more burden, which we know the two things that hurt CTs, heat and burden or resistance, okay? So traditionally, only the meter is tested. And, but like we said, it only measures like there in the red square. So we're only looking outside that red square what's going on out there. If you just test that meter, you don't see that. If you just do a phantom load test on that meter, if you pull the meter and stick it into a test board and test just the meter, all of the rest of that diagram there is not included in that. It's just the meter, okay? So the instrument transformers uh, control uh, metered values. What if they do not produce the expected outputs? So you can see here, I've, I can have PTs and CTs involved. And remember, this is the old analogy I've used before if you see me at the meter school. I had buddies that tended bar in school and they would come home mad because the drawer had come up short and they had to pay out of their pockets to make the drawer right. The cash register, which we tend to call meters, right? That's what I heard when I started, cash register, cash register, cash register. The cash register didn't do anything wrong. It was who was putting money in and out of that drawer. And that's our CTs and our PTs and our wiring. It's everything outside that box, right? So wiring and junctions connect the meter. Uh, what if there are wiring errors or poor connections? Poor junctions will overburden the CTs and reduce revenue. That's exactly what I just said, Segno, which is all of the stuff feeding that meter, the wiring, the CTs, and the PTs, that can be the real problem. And once again, it's just like a cash register. What you put in and out of it, it doesn't know what's going on outside of that box. Billing accuracy. So even if the meter is perfect, the billing may not be correct. So you got, uh, and we're going to show it here in a second. You remember the pie chart we show at the meter schools. You got sources of billing errors include the CTs. You can have uh, bad, overburdened, shunted. Uh, that's horrific. Uh, shunted CTs, um, or you, you don't have the correct CT in there. PTs, same thing. They can be overburdened or not correct. And uh, then you can have uh, faulty or incorrect wiring. Uh, too small a wiring, uh, not, not, uh, it's not run correctly, uh, it's cross fade, polarity reversal, things like that. Um, the meter is, uh, not act, is not accurate under actual customer load conditions. Um, I remember hearing years ago about uh, one of our guys that um, if you pulled the meter, he was in a foreign country and is out there testing with him, if you stuck the meter in a, uh, we have obviously a, uh, a field portable uh, test board that we have, our 4 series, and if you plug into that, the meter tested fine, when he plugged it back into a real big recycling site, which was a really horrible load in there, the accuracy went way, way, way down. So as long as he tested it with nice sinusoidal waves at the points of the meter, everything was fine. And then when he plugged it back in the socket and they tested it, and not so good. So then you have uh, cl uh, the uh, clerical errors, which normally we always, the one we always ping on that one is billing multipliers, right? And then you obviously have theft. And here's the chart uh, where you can see we had a utility uh, a municipal here in Tennessee. We looked at 35,000 uh, transformer rated installations. It was a three-year study that we did. And you can see how it fell out there. We have the uh, wiring error. We, the, the categories are you have administrative error, wiring error, faulty meter, theft of service, uh, CT problems, or PT problems. And so what would you think would be the percentages and which was which? So the wiring errors you can see there was 19%, which would be polarity reversal, uh, wrong size wires, thing like that. Um, PT problems, uh, that was the uh, 7%. Administrative errors, um, that could be also uh, billing multipliers. And then um, faulty, uh, the faulty meter, if you had a problem with the meter, was 19. Uh, CT problems, you can see the CT and PT problems about the same 7%. And then theft of service was 37 I'm sorry, 11. So um, those are the categories that fell out when we did that, uh, we did that study at that uh, municipal here in the state. So you can see where they kind of fall out as far as which is which. And uh, you can see that 
the biggies that hit us are the billing multipliers and the wiring errors. If you add those numbers together, it's a large percentage of where the problems are. Okay. So when we did it, we actually uh, can show you some numbers here on it. Um, the total problems found on all those sites, we had 96 of them. And of course, so you're seeing what percentage of all of them. So, uh, so we said we did 10% of them, so we tested uh, 3,500 meters, right? So 96 out of those had problems, or 2.7% of them had problems. Now the total lost revenue found was $2,248,354. So then you look at the average loss found per, per problem or per, uh, per the problems that we found there, and it was 23420 So they are significant. Um, most of the time when I get calls and I hear from people, I've never gotten a call where, yeah, we found we're losing a few dollars on a site. It's always usually very significant. So that's why we, you know, you've heard us preach it, an integrated site test, where we want to uh, do an actual site analysis, test everything on the site. Um, we want to test the, uh, that's be the wiring and the connections and everything. Also, we want to test those PTs and CTs, and we want to test the meter, okay? So the wiring can be wrong or faulty. Uh, the meter measures, like we said, only the current reaching the meter terminals. So if those aren't correct, um, then we can have problems. So when we do an integrated site test, if you look at a site analysis, remember how important those vectors are. So when you look at the vectors, um, immediately problems can jump out. And they tend to be significant if they jump out on the, on the vectors, if we see a problem on the vectors. So you can see in this one, my yellow, which is my B phase, and my blue, which is C phase, my vectors are not together. I don't have my voltage and current blue vectors together and my voltage and current yellows together. So since I have that, that would indicate to me first glance out in the field, I'm going to think I have something cross phase between B and C phases, right? Um, so like I just said, they're a very powerful tool. And uh, one of the things you don't, we tend to jump into the angles and, and the, the relationship between the vectors, and you tend to forget about the amplitude of them. But the amplitude, the length of those vectors indicates the amplitude. So a vector that shows 120 volt is going to be half as long as a vector that shows 240 volt for a voltage vector. So if you see a very, if two of them look real, are the same length, are pretty close to the same length, and one of them is way shorter right on top of the axis, then it's telling you my amplitude is way down on that phase. And you've seen that when you hook up to a, a C leg, high C leg, and, uh, and there's nothing on that one. Okay, I don't have any lighting going in, none of my 208 lighting is going on the site, so that high C leg might be initially before they start turning things on, it could be right on top of the axis. So I could have that blue arrowhead right on top of the axis, and uh, A and B phases look fine, but C phase, I'm showing almost nothing because I haven't turned on any of the stuff that's on that high C leg, okay? So here, so what should the vector diagram look like? So obviously with the different service and service types, you get a lot of these different uh, vectors here, and what, you have a connect view of a uh, vector, and then you also have the meter view, right? So it's the way the meter is measuring the power versus how you actually connect to that meter and what you're looking for. And for instance, uh, that bottom left one down there, um, you can see that, uh, that I've got on B phase, I'm showing a current there, but my connect view would actually be different because for that 6S, my connect view, I'm just dealing with relationships and using B as a, as a reference between the two. So I'd really show just, I would show just A and C uh, vectors, but they're relational now. So if you see on there, it's measuring like VAB or VBC versus just VA or VB or VC. That's because there's a relationship between those vectors, okay? So you can see there on the bottom left one, that bottom left corner, that would be more the meter view. That's how the meter is actually measuring the power. But when you connect it, you have to also have some, a connection and read that, uh, that B phase. You can see it again. So there's the connect view versus meter view. All right. So uh, services are uh, generally simple. You can see the delta up in the upper left-hand corner up there. I've got my delta where I got 240. I got 240 on every one of them, A to B, B to C, A to C, right? So that's one of the advantages of a delta is if I lose a leg, I can still grab 240, okay? 
but when you get into the whys, if I lose legs, then I'm out of luck. So that was one of the advantages we mentioned in a previous um, webinar, uh, talking about differences between Delta and Y services. And that was one of the things that, that we said on that. So we, as we mentioned before, the, uh, the vector diagrams are very powerful and they show you everything. And when we're out in the field and we talk with you about this, we talk about you've got reference buttons also to look and just show you before you get out there and you see something squirrely on the vectors, you can look and see what you should expect. And you can toggle between the connect view and the meter view like we just showed. So you have the, not just the vectors when you initially hook up, but you've seen in some of the previous webinars where we've toggled between primary and secondary as well. So the vectors on the test kits can show you what are the, what's going on on the primary side versus the secondary side. Because remember that, that the phrase we use so much, the secondary follows the primary. So you can toggle between them and you can discover then my problem's actually on my primary versus my secondary side. Because initially, unless you change it, the test kits can show you the secondary side. But if you want to toggle over to the primary, you can. And that way, you might discover that's where the problem is. So uh, testing current transformers, you know, what's wrong on this uh, diagram right here? Well, any, uh, any of the students we've had that have been watching should recognize right away, once again, I don't have my vectors on A phase, the red, together. And in this case, they're literally 180 degrees apart. So when they go 180 degrees apart like that, and this is showing the secondary side, this would indicate to me that we have wired the CT wrong on A phase and we've swapped our, uh, our connections there on the terminals. So, and when that happens, why is that such a big problem for you and I? And we've talked about this a bunch of times. It causes my power factor to go negative. And when my power factor goes negative on that phase, remember, to get my watts, it's voltage times current times power factor. And when that power factor is negative on that one phase, I end up with negative watts on that one phase. And when I get negative watts on that one phase, to get the total watts, I do a summation of all three phases. If it's three phases, I'm measuring and testing. And then I'm going to subtract the one phase from the other two. So if it's balanced, if I have 800 watts on each phase, I'll have a negative 800, an 800, and an 800 for a grand total of 800 instead of 2,400. So, um, so I will be losing two-thirds of my revenue. So here, what's wrong? Okay, so on this one, when I'm testing CTs, it says at the top, so for a CT situation, here we go again. I don't have the corresponding, and that's why we have the colors of the vectors to make it really easy to jump out to at you on that VGA color screen that we have on our test equipment. Okay, so when you look at that and it jumps out at you on the colors, we try and do that purposefully, of course, so that you can look at that and go, I think I have cross phase on A and B phases right here. So, hey, we got it right. So we have uh, A and B, the CTs are swapped there. So I have a cross phasing on that, okay? Now what happens on a cross phase is, if you think about it, I cross phased A and B phases and C phase was correct. So I would have had total watts on C phase, okay? I would, if I have, uh, I'm just throwing numbers out there. If I have 100 watts on C, I would have a negative 50, balance of course, I would have a negative 50 uh, on each of A and C phases when I measured them. So what's my grand total? Zip. Okay, so that would negative 50 plus negative 50 plus 100 is zip. So if everything's balanced out, yeah, it's not good for us at all if I have cross phasing. All right. You could have bad wiring on the, on the voltage circuit. So um, you can see that you, here, if uh, you can reduce the available current to the meter so it doesn't have VA to operate properly. Um, I have an example of on our, uh, I was talking about the 4 Series earlier, our 4 Series is that portable test board that you can carry around. So it's made to, you can use it inside as well. When you use it inside and you plug it in the wall and you try and test a 2S meter, I can, I can only get 120 volts. So 120 volts is not going to power up that meter. So if I have a problem on my voltage circuit, I wouldn't have enough to uh, power up the meter. Okay. Um, also, other things that, that we've talked about in the past, which can affect it, is the wire size and length. Because remember, there is so much resistance per foot on wire. So, and obviously, the smaller the wire, the more resistance. So you can see here, I've got number 14 wire, 50 feet of it. So what happens uh, when I'm, I can do the calculations here, I can say I can get 0.006 percentage error. But now if I throw a bad connection in there, 
right, which adds that resistance, which is obviously bad for us. Remember, I'm adding more resistance. When I add more resistance, it's going to drop the current. So now just adding that four ohms on there, which you don't have to have a really bad connection to create four ohms of resistance, it jumps all the way to 0.7, okay, percent. Now on the current circuit, um, if you have, uh, we, we bring into account what we talked about earlier, which is that uh, the burden, the, uh, the bad boy burden that we don't like. So a faulty connection can easily add a few tenths of an ohm of burden. Um, then you have improper wiring, missing commons, multiple grounds. We don't like multiple grounds, right? That's why when you hear us talk to you about testing in the field and making your field connections, um, we like to have, uh, especially with the 7 Series, which has both a ground and a neutral connection, we like them both to be at the same physical point if we can. We don't like to spread out those connections in case you have a problem on your ground circuit somewhere. Okay? And it, at the very bottom, very true, almost all wiring errors result in reduced billing. It seems like any problems out in the field, always, act, they always work against us, don't we? We always tend to lose money, almost all the time. It's almost usually in the customer's favor or against us, if you want to look at it that way. So using too small a gauge wire can result in overburden. Like we talked about before, um, if you've got uh, the number 14, uh, you can see it's, it's got uh, 0.14 ohms. So when you calculate out number 14 per foot uh, resistance times the 50 foot, you end up with 0.14. Well, if you've got a 0.1 burden class CT, you're already over that. And now, and that, like we said in previous webinars, so everybody's bumped up to 12. So when they bumped up to 12 now, I'm still right on the edge, right? So 50 foot of number 12, I'm at 0.09. And remember, it's a 0.1 burden class CT. So what that means is that if I put more than 0.1 ohms of burden on that CT, I'm going to start going the wrong way on the accuracy. And remember what I said earlier, it usually always acts against us. So, um, so that's why you're seeing a lot of people now going number 10, so that they, can, uh, they have a lot more um, allowance now off of what is the burden class rating on that CT. So that without any bad connections or other problems using too small a wire size, can ensure you get the worst performance from your CT. So you can have great connections, but if you run too small a wire, just that resistance created through the resistance per foot of a small wire can cause you problems. So the CTs are one of the lowest accuracy items in the chain, right? You got a uh, you got 0.2 meters, but then uh, you've got 0.3 accuracy class on the CTs, and that's when it's you remember all of them. Now we've changed on the CT some now with these extended ranges and rain factor stuff. But generally we always said it was 0.3 when it was fully loaded on 100% and perfect. But as soon as we got off of that, remember the bathtub curves, then you're 0.6. Okay? So the accuracy dec decreases rapidly with the burden. We said the two things that hurt them, burden or resistance and temperature. So if the RF exceeded the accuracy, it decreases rapidly. Okay? So if you go past the rating factor on that CT, it starts going bad too. The simplified version is, without all of that, is you just looked at the standard meter. It didn't have extended rating. It didn't have rating factors. You would just say, at zero, we're going to see in a second, we said the two biggies were 10% of the rating of that CT and 100%. So if it was a 400 to 5 CT, we looked at 40 amps on that CT versus 400 amps. And we looked at what was between that. And as soon as you got less than 40 amps, it started getting really bad. And as soon as you overloaded it over 400 amps, it started getting really bad. There's been changes with the, the new advancement in these CTs. That was always what we went for. Years and years and years, that's what we looked at. And here's the bathtub curves, just like we're talking about. And you see that at the very bottom, that 10% that I talked about and the 100%. But now, of course, with the extended, with the rating factors where you can get out farther now. So if you had a rating factor of 4, it stays really flat all the way out to 400. And then you have extended range, which can get you uh, really accurate all the way down to low, on the very low end. But the two numbers that we used for years were the 10% and the 100%. If you got outside of that, we generally had problems. But now, at least with these, uh, the CTs, they've gotten a lot better and have really helped the utilities in what they have to stock and how accurate they can be. That low end was always a problem for us, wasn't it? Where you had a building full of machinery that suddenly that got moved somewhere and now it's just a warehouse. So the load just dropped dramatically. So now I'm getting towards that left end of that axis right there, and I'm starting to get bad. So you do a CT ratio test with burden testing. When you get out there, you can do a, a ratio. They call it a ratio burden test or a ratio plus burden test or however you want to say it. 
So the ratio test we're going to see in a second is, remember, I'm just comparing. You're telling me it's a 400 to 5 CT. So you're telling me if I put 400 amps through that CT, I should expect 5 amps on my secondary terminals going down to that meter, right? So I need to be able to check that ratio, 400 to 5. I measure my primary current. I measure my secondary current. And I see just how close it is to 405 with the present load on there, okay? And it says here, let me read what you put. Ratio testing is the preferred approach when we can gain access to the CT primary, absolutely. We have various types of probes that can be used, right? We got the, the red flexes that we use that wrap around, like he's using right there. You can also use the, uh, the high volt probe that's on the end of the extendo, you can see where he's there in that sub. And we even have the, uh, the, the clamp on primary ones, the 752s you saw us using the other day. So we do have different ways of measuring that. But you got to measure the primary to compare it to the secondary to do a ratio test. So that's not, you got to measure those two or you can't do the test, okay? Now on the, uh, the burden testing, right, you have to have a test switch to be able to do the burden testing with our equipment because I'm, I'm driving, I'm using the duct bills here, okay, to add the resistance there. So I need somewhere to put those duct bills. The duct bills for us, they drive current, right? They measure current, but they also are used to add resistance. Okay, so you can see your secondary connection is made through the test switch. The same connection is used for the rest of the site testing. That's right, to do the burden testing. And ratio testing with applied burden is the most accurate and complete approach for testing uh, CT and service. And that's absolutely correct. So if I can test the CT, test its ratio under burden, then I'm adding what we don't want to it, which is burden, just to see how it's working when we add some burden to it. Because what we're looking for typically on that one, as we've talked about in the past, is if you start adding any burden to it at all, and suddenly it just bottoms out, then there's a situation there. It's, it's hanging on. It's right on the ragged edge. Either you've got some loose wires or some of the previous problems we talked about. You discover you've got bad connections, too long of a run of wire, whatever it is. So it's right there on the edge, but it's okay. But if we know it's right on the ragged edge and I add 0.1 ohms and it bottoms out, I'm losing money every day. It hasn't failed but I'm losing money every day. So what a burden added test typically is looking for, it simulates a failure of the CT. So when I add 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and suddenly I see that secondary current just drop off dramatically, I've literally added burden resistance enough to choke off that CT so that now I'm not getting anything out of my secondary terminals. So if that happens, then that's it. That, but that is simulating a failure of the CT. And that's one thing, but you and I are worried about lost revenue every single day. And if you don't test those CTs and test them this way, you're not going to find that because it hasn't failed. It's just costing you money every single day. So integrated site test philosophy, um, reference uh, CTs measured using the Power Master. So when you measure it, we're looking uh, for our, our parallelograms, right? And on our parallelograms, uh, the way we typically do our parallelograms is, I'll go back to it, is, you know, you have the, the two sets of parallelograms. The small one's the IEEE parallelogram. And that's set, they, they've set that and there's no change in that. The larger one is the user-defined parallelogram. And that's where you adjust how tight an accuracy you want to test on that CT. And when you do that, it expands out that uh, parallelogram and it gets larger. So the larger one is what you have defined as the users, what you consider pass or fail. The other one is IEEE controlled and it is what it is. The, the smallest little trapezoid in there is there a 0 0.3 accuracy class then expands out to the next one is 0 0.6 and then the orange one that John will show in a second is the user defined yes so sometimes for example uh, the customer may want to expand that two percent of yes. a rating that's what the orange would represent absolutely the, vo the voice from nowhere <laughs> off camera <laughs> off camera <laughs> <laughs> the voice of knowledge goes in. I love it. So, um, and Chris is exactly correct, and we'll see that here in just a second. But in this case, because of what you saw off of here, clearly everything fell in well within. So, I mean, that's some awesome. That's an awesome test right there. So, when you go to here, you can see here pass, pass, pass. So, when you're hit at that tight, you're definitely passing it. And if you look down there, look at those ratio errors. Um, I don't know that I've seen that good out in the field. That's very, very, very good, and that's why they were all, it, look, it looked like a, a sniper's uh, a, a target, right? So it was all over that, uh, the dead center.
So, and, and here, um, there's another screen that you can look at on the test equipment, which actually, um, if you go out, you have graphs, and then you have tables and charts, and it'll show you that. And you can see, in this case, it's not as apparent because of those really good numbers. But as you add more resistance, right, then you should get a worse test, right? You should, as you're adding burden to it, you add the burden to it, the accuracy should go down, because that's the nature of the CTs, right? And the ratio error would also do the same as I keep adding resistance. And you'd see across the top there, it has 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 1, 2, and 4 ohms. So for, uh, as you know, for us, the 3 series goes up to the 2 ohms, and the 7 series goes up to 4 ohms. So you can see here in this case, uh, clearly phase C looks bad. It's outside of everything. Okay, so we've got an outlier on C phase. It isn't playing nice with anything. It's outside parallelograms. It's way outside of everything. And sure enough, when we got ready to test, as it turned out, someone was trying to access some free power. So, so that's what happened. We found that wire running through C phase. So then once we removed the wire, then everything looked a lot better. PTs. Now we brought these up a little bit uh, before about you know, you have all of the, the components, you know, of a site. You have the meter, the CTs, and possibly PTs. Well, all of these have an accuracy and an inaccuracy level, right? So as you keep adding to them, they have their, you know, pros and cons. The PTs obviously make it a lot safer at the bottom of the pole. The voltage allowed there, which means the power allowed there at the bottom of the pole. But they are adding, adding in another component with an accuracy to it and also an inaccuracy to it. So when you add that to it, um, that you're going to add a little inaccuracy to it, but it does allow you to work a lot safer and have um, a lot more allowable as far as from a safety standpoint and working and the size of the components like we talked about before. Um, so I've got a lot less power at the bottom of the pole if I reduce my voltage at the bottom of the pole. So when we, when we test uh, potential transformers, you can see here's a pass, pass, pass test. So these were four to ones, and when we pass them, just exactly like we talked about on the CTs, it is a comparison on a ratio test of primary versus secondary. So you will compare the primary voltage to the secondary voltage. And so you will need something to read the primary voltage, some sort of a probe that will pick up the primary, and then you will compare it to the secondary. If you have a test switch, it will be those alligator clips that are attached to that test switch picking up your voltage down there on the secondary side. You get an overloaded PT, and uh, you can see here, the pretty turquoise, that uh, it causes some crazes. You can see undersized PT can lead to overburden situation and waveform distortion, especially with high-end meters. So you don't want to overload the PTs. Overloading either the PTs or the CTs causes us problems. So meter performance under real-world conditions. So we're talking about real world. So the fact that a meter is accurate in the lab does not mean it is accurate in the field. Well, why is that? Remember what we're doing when we're in the lab. We're plugging into a, a, a test board, which runs nice, pretty sinusoidal waves. It has specific test points, but it is disconnected from back those very first diagrams we looked at. You're looking at what's just inside that box. All the other stuff, wiring, connections, PTs, CTs, is not taken into account when you do a lab test on that meter. Okay? Harmonics is not taken on it. Rapidly changing loads, power factor variations. All that stuff can affect the accuracy. And when you just test just that meter, then you're not looking at all the other stuff from that diagram we looked at in the beginning. That's why we preach the integrated site test, or IST. And you've seen it on previous webinars where you can set it up where it'll just go from one test to the next to the next. And uh, that way you're not jumping from menu to menu, but this way you get a full site analysis, which is what we're looking for. Because the meter is not just the problem at all when it comes to lost revenue. So you're going to uh, do the meter testing. So here, a customer load test. And we've talked about this in previous ones. This is a real world condition. So I am not pulling the meter and disconnecting it and running a load through it from a load box. I'm using what's going on at that customer today and now. Okay, and of course, everything's gonna be date and time stamped. You can say, I was here Thursday at two o'clock, sir. And here's what was going on on the other side of your wall. And so it's going to pick up voltage and current harmonics, current and phase angle balances, um, and anything that affects it, bad power factors because of too much inductance or capacitance. All of that stuff is going to 
come into play now because I'm seeing what's going on behind the wall. Load box test. That is the one we've been talking about so far, which is the ANSI test or phantom load test. And that's where I do use the load box. I pull it, I plug it in. So here's where we always talk about, there's the, the process and thought process and philosophy of, do I do an ANSI or phantom load test on the meter or do I do a customer load on the meter? Uh, I personally think that the customer load test out there, especially on a complaint. You know, I've been out in the field before. I remember I was down, uh, down south and we were at a church and uh, the pastor and maintenance man were there with us at the church. He was complaining about his bill. And when they pulled the meter to go stick it in one of our test kits, he jumped in between us and said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? And he literally said, I don't know what your magic box is doing. I want you to stick it back in my socket and test it. Test it. So there is something, too, especially on a customer complaint. They want to see you test it in there while it's working with their load and working on, in normal conditions. If you pull them and disappear with them and come back, that sometimes, as far as PR and the customer, uh, the way that they see it, they don't see that as, a, as positive, okay? So here would be a customer load meter test. And we do a customer load meter test, and we talked about this. We have pulses expected versus pulses actual. So what happens is you will, uh, when you enter in the site and enter in the type of meter, if you said it was a 9S, that means that you put in 1.8 as the case of T. When you put that 1.8 in there, that means... Every time it saw 1.8 watts, it would pulse, okay? Then what we do with the connections there, with the connections at a test switch, it would be connections of duck bills and alligator clips. Uh, you would compare the voltage and the current times the power factor and say, okay, here were the watts we measured. So you said it was 1.8 watts because it just pulsed because that's what you said. You told me it was a 9S, but we measured it and we're going to compare the two, okay? So the comparison is the pulse's actual was the count of the pulses with the pickup either a mag pickup or a flex or whatever you have there at that COM port or on the face of the meter that's counting the pulses. And here it's counted out 10 pulses. But when it counted out the 10 pulses and then compared it to what it measured, the number of pulses according to the measurements should have actually been 9.9985. And the comparison of those two is 100.015 between pulses actual and pulses expected. On the ANSI or phantom load test, you set that up with, like we've talked about, a full load, a power factor, and a light load test. The 10% between full load and light load and power factor being 0.5, you can see there. So what it does, it tests it per a designated set of pulses, and it does a full load test, a power factor, and a light load. And this will be run through a load box, and the CTs will be shunted and disconnected off the circuit, so you're not getting your current from your CTs, you're getting it from a load box. So integrated site test philosophy here, you, well, you can also do a demand test. A demand test where you're doing over a period of time. Um, I don't see a lot of this out there in the field, uh, to be honest, but there are some folks that still do demand tests. And when they do the demand test, they're just testing over a designated period of time, you know, 5, 10, or 15 minutes. You can also, with, uh, with the equipment, our equipment, you can do trending. So while you're connected and doing a customer load test, it's going to plot here for you. If you wanted to just sit there and let it run a long, long time, then you could plot it over a long, long time. And in the case you're showing here on the screen, you can see a dip in C phase right there. So you see that dip in C phase, that might be something. And when you use uh, power, power quality monitor, stuff like that you're putting on there, that's what you're looking for, right? Sags, dips. So here you could see one right here on C phase, the blue, that we did have one right there. Okay, so you saw a current dip right there. We had voltage trend, current trend, and then the watts trend. So the voltage looked like it stayed pretty steady, but when I got the drop in current, then my overall watts, right, would drop because voltage times current times power factor equals watts. Okay. Uh, meter performance under real world conditions, uh, large errors can occur in the calculation of uh, VA and VARs. So there's even also an inherent issue of how are you calculating and getting those numbers. There's different ones. Luckily, on the equipment, you can choose according to the way that your utility is doing it. We have different settings on there to line up with that. But you can see there, the variations can be pretty large. We've even had people call in and saying, I'm, my numbers aren't looking good on this, but when they changed that setting to the way that they calculated them, then they got better tests. Okay. Clerical errors, uh, like we talked about in the pie chart, um, those can, uh, no amount of testing will detect those, right? So, um, but only care and careful procedures will eliminate these errors. But remember what we've talked about. 
the two best tools that you have are your eyes and between your ears. So if you walk out there and you can see a clerical error, check those billing multipliers while you're there. If, you're, if they're written on the inside of the can, open that can up and look at what that number is and then see what size your CTs are and see if that's right. And if you have CTs and PTs, check it to make sure it's right. Okay? Because the equipment is not going to be able to pick that up. But you can look at it with your eye and you can do a little in your head and go, well, wait a minute, that can't be right. When I look at the size of those CTs and then PTs, there's no way. And uh, not all problems are natural. Unfortunately, um, you have diversion prior to the meter, so we're talking about theft here. And they are getting awful darn creative, right? So um, some of the problems are that. Now, the great thing about this is that uh, the same testing that finds revenue loss due to the equipment problems also finds revenue loss due to theft. So as we saw in the other one, where that someone had put an extra wire in there, we picked that up, didn't we? So uh, when, when they ran that through on their CTs. So the equipment will pick up theft. Um, we've even had people way back in the day, that was one of the initial, we had a, a guy that was just asking us, please, 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 come up with a piece of equipment that's a lighter so I can go in there because I'm checking on thefts. That's all I do. And I need to get in and out pretty quick, you know, in certain areas. So he was a big proponent years ago before the development of the 3 Series, the light handheld model. He kept begging us for it because he, that was his job, to just look for theft. Okay, and the equipment will show that. So estimating errors. Uncertainty when nothing is wrong. In other words, everything's great. This is where we've talked about before of because of the accuracy of the components, there's an overall accuracy class for, the, for, for everything, right? So I've got meters, CTs, and PTs. So you can see here down at the bottom, worst case error estimate. So I have, if I have 0.2 on the meter, 0.3 on the CTs, and 0.3 on the PTs, which is really good, I, I, I'm still at 0.8. If I have uh, 0.2 on the meter, but remember I'm going now from 0.3 to 0.6, remember the bathtub curve, so it doubles on me, um, and I'm talking about just very standard. You know, once again, I'm not talking about uh, rating factors or extended ranges and all that. I'm just saying generally what we've always said is it doubles its inaccuracy going from 0.3 to 0.6. So you can see there it jumps to 1.1. So if everything is working correctly, uh, about 1% is the worst uh, error we can find. So when actually really matters, uh, so what do you do when 1.1% uh, accuracy is not enough? Well, here's where we have, um, we have equipment now, we have components, we have the, these uh, different products now that we can definitely increase the accuracy, right? Um, Chris and I haven't seen one out there, but they have a 0.1% accuracy class meter that you can get out there, okay? And if you put that out there and then also put some 0.15% accuracy CTs and 0.15% PTs, now look at what you're doing. You got 0.1 plus 0.15 plus 0.15, now we're at 0.4 which remember what we were talking about before was 0.8. So, um, and also you'll see at this bottom end on the left-hand side, remember when you're talking extended range, we're maintaining that 0.15 all the way down to 5%. That's pretty amazing. And also because it's pretty amazing, it's pretty expensive. So it would be, uh, but you can see now we do have the components now that you can increase your accuracy off of the standards if you wanted to spend the money and get the components. So when accuracy really matters, uh, we can reasonably obtain, um, so off, like we just said, I got a little head, you can, if you do the 0 0.1, the 0 0.15, and 0 0.15, the worst case scenario here is 0.4. So it, it's expensive, like I said, but it's definitely doable. So if your requirements are to be more accurate than the, than the standard components, uh, anymore you can go with the uh, more accurate components that are out there, okay? So. I hope we've uh, covered some of these differences. Uh, now you see why, as a company, we preach the integrated site test philosophy. Because uh, just testing just the meter and just testing just the meter under uh, uh, the ANSI test or phantom load test, if you're looking at that site and it's all about lost revenue, right, um, you're not really getting a good picture and good view of places you can be losing revenue. If you just pull that meter and run a nice pretty sine wave through it and you control the load on it, you're not really testing that site at all. And honestly, you're really not testing that meter because you need it under the conditions that it's going to be plugged back into. Okay? So, um, upcoming schedule. Um, on uh, Next week, uh, we're going to actually wire up a 9S meter socket. So, you'll get to see the wiring up of a socket. Um, we're going to go through all the components of that, do's and don'ts. 
and then we're even going to wire up another socket later in the week. But uh, for uh, Tuesday, it will be a 9S socket that we're going to be wiring up. Okay? So, hope you got something out of this. Uh, now maybe you understand why we preach so much uh, testing the, the CTs, the meter, the PTs, and everything on the site, and why we, uh, we're big proponents of the customer load test. Uh, we really appreciate the, uh, the, the support that we're getting on this. Uh, we're getting some great feedback. And if you get a chance, as I said before, if there's anything you can think of, we just got one this morning. I got a call last night on an idea somebody had, and we appreciate that, Jesse. And we're going to now incorporate that into a future webinar. But um, we we're looking for ideas like that. This was a great one. So we're looking at maybe doing a more advanced uh, testing uh, webinar, which will cover some of these things. And this would be a great one for that. So we appreciate that. If you have any ideas uh, that you've got, anything you'd like to see, uh, please send it in to us. Because uh, in the way things are going right now, we're really dependent on you because I can't go stand and talk to you now. I'm depending on you to, uh, to contact us in here and give us some great ideas, and we will definitely put them in there. And I also want to say I really appreciate folks that are telling us, even though they can't see it live, that they've now incorporated these into their safety meetings and that, so they are showing them off of either uh, the website or YouTube, and they're showing them again, and people are watching them. So we really appreciate that, and mainly, we're just, uh, we miss getting to see you guys. I miss being on the road. But uh, we're trying to do what we can to still stay in touch with you guys and to still uh, hopefully uh, give you some good information you guys can use. So uh, thanks, God bless, and please be careful out there.